Jenny. Ja. Om Magana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanya Hare Krishna Maharaj. Turn up pranam. Hare Krishna Maharaj. You are on mute. Oh. Huh. Okay. Om Magyana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschachadeshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Padita Nam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav and we are on Canto 6 and today we're looking at chapter 18. Right, we're chapter 18. Chapter 18, Deity Vows to Kill King Indra. Sounds exciting, eh? It is. <laughs> I thought it was a very exciting chapter. All right, so we were hearing, we, the last chapter, we were dealing with Chitraketu. And now we're hearing about Deity. So it's a big changeover in the continuity, right? We heard about Vritasura and then we heard about Chitraketu, how Chitraketu was cursed to become Vritasura. And we heard about uh, Vritasura going back to Godhead. So that was the end of that session. That was a uh, that took us from chapter 7 up to chapter 17. Now we're at chapter 18. So like 11 chapters were there with uh, Vritasura and Chitraketu. So now we're back to Diti. Back to because if you remember when you were doing uh, chapter number 6, Chapter number six, we were, you were hearing about the, well, you heard about Daksha, and you heard about Daksha having many daughters. Do you remember how many daughters Daksha had? Any Thirteen daughters. Huh? Thirteen. How many? Thirteen, Maharaj. Really? Well, 13 were given to Kashyapa. To Kashyapa, yeah, that's right. But, but there were many, there were 60. There was a total of 60 daughters, but 13 were given in marriage to Kashyapa. And of these 13, two 
are, of course, are very prominent. Uh, Aditi and Diti. So we heard about Diti's sons. How many sons did Diti have by Kashyapa? How many? Two. Oh. Oh, that was by D Diti. Yeah. What about Aditi? Aditi has How many? Twelve, right. A twelve. And among them was the personality of Godhead, Lord Vamanadev. Right? So, chapter six, we had heard up, up to uh, Twasta. Twasta. Remember Twasta? He was, and he, he was brought, he came into the picture in uh, Chitra, in the story of Vritasura, because it was Twasta who was the father, who fathered Vritasura. He produced Vritasura from the sacrificial fire. So Twasta was the fourth son of Aditi. So that was up in, in chapter 6. And then, you know, they brought up the point about how Twasta had produced the, the great demon Vritasura, who was actually a great devotee. So that was what happened there. In, uh, Chapter 6. So now it's coming back to hearing, we're hearing more about Diti. We heard, they heard, we heard about the different sons of Aditi. And in this chapter we're going to hear about Aditi, we're going to hear about Diti, but first we will hear more about the other sons of Aditi. That's brought up first. You want to hear about the other sons of Aditi. So the chapter begins like that. Sukadeva Goswami is speaking about the, the, the fifth son, because we said Twasta was the fourth son, and now we're going on from the fourth, the fifth son, you've got seven more sons to hear about. So they're mentioned here, one after the other, Savitri, and they're different, how many children they have and everything. So you hear about them. And it, uh, in, in text number six, we hear about uh, we hear about producing children by taking the semen. It's mentioned about they they had seen Urvasi, and because they saw Urvasi, Mitra and Varuna discharged their semen. And that semen was collected in an, in an earthen pot. And then later on it was used to produce some great personalities. So Prabhupada said, modern science, of course nowadays modern, modern science, they also do like that. They will take the sperm, the, the semen from some people and they will save it and they will use it to produce children. So it's nothing new. It's nothing new in modern science. This was all. This was done millions of years ago in the, in the past, in the days of yore, long ago. It was all done before. It was done much easier than it's done today. So that point comes up, and then we hear about. Oh well. We're told about how uh, later on you're going to hear about Bali Maharaj, which or Vamanade, the twelfth son, and that will be taught in the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So that's mentioned, Urukram, or Lord Vamanadev, comes up in text number 8. 
you know, hear about his appearance. And then we're going to hear about Diti and about her children. So, Diti, of course, had two sons who were well-known, big demons, Haranyaksha and Haranyakashipu. And we hear about their children, and of course, Prahlad is the son of Haranyakashipu, and he has some brothers who are all mentioned, and then the, the sister also. So this, this, this way, the beginning of the chapter is all spent describing these different descendants coming from the Diti and Aditi. And we even hear about people like Vatapi and Ovala, who are really from Ramayana. They're, that's, they're mentioned in Ramayana, but they come up here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then we hear about Bali Maharaj, and he has 100 sons. The oldest of his 100 sons is Bana, Banasura, who is the great devotee of Lord Shiva. And he's mentioned also in the 10th canto. And then then Sukadeva Goswami talks about the 49 Maruts. The 49 Marut demigods were also born from the womb of a Di from the womb of Diti. None of them had sons. Although they were born of Diti, King Indra gave them a position as demigods. So this is this is creates a little uh, attention in the mind of Maharaj Parikshit because usually the sons of Diti are demons and they will have the demonic nature and Aditi she's the one to give birth to the demigods who are, can have good qualities so this is this is going to puzzle the mind of Maharaj Parikshit, and he will ask a question about this. Maybe I'll just share the screen for you on this, and you can follow the text, right? It's better. You like to see the text? Let me share the screen. Are you able to see okay? Yeah? Yeah? We can see, yeah. Yeah. So even the demons can be transformed into demigods, as the statement of this verse proves. So that's the point, really, that we want to learn from this verse, that, you know, we're, we could be demons, we all may be demons, but we can become devotees. We have bad qualities, we can develop good qualities. People can change. And, of course, the criterion is not birth. We see here the 49 Maruts are all born in the womb of Diti, and usually the, the children from the womb of Diti were demons, but here Indra is going to take them all as demigods, take them to the heavenly planets to be demigods, because they're the Maruts. So when Maharaj Parikshit hears about this, He's very puzzled about this. He wants to know what's going on. Maharaj Parikshit inquires. Hmm. He wants to know what is what is this? Uh, how is it like this? Why did Indra, the king of heaven, convert them into demigods? Did they perform any rituals or pious activities? 
they must have had a demonic mentality. In the Bhagavad Gita, we read how Krishna, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna that you don't have to worry, Arjuna, because you are born with a divine mentality. You have a godly mentality. So, and then Prabhupada talks about birth, how it's very important. So here we have the Maruts, that they're born from the womb of Diti. And Diti had given birth, other, her other children were demons. How is it these children could be demigods? So, when this question is raised by Maharaj Parikshit, Sukadev Goswami, uh, Sutta, Sutta Goswami mentions in his words to Sukadeva Goswami, he says, uh, this is text number 22, he talks about uh, Maharaj Parikshit, after hearing Maharaj Parikshit speak respectfully and briefly on topics essential to hear, Sukadeva Goswami, who was well aware of everything, praised his endeavor with great pleasure and replied. So, how he was so pleased with it that it's described here, artavat, meaningful, right? The word is there, artavat, meaningful. This, this term here, meaningful. So, why is it so meaningful? Because we will, we will see some uh, wonderful uh, philosophical concepts revealed in the course of this incident. We're going to hear how these... We're going to hear how the even a learned person's mind can be disturbed or can be influenced through the association of the opposite sex. And we're going to also hear how we have the tendency to look at others and not to see ourselves. That will also be highlighted in the course of this pastime. And a third feature of this section is that we will see the wonderful power of devotion and how by devotion to Lord Vishnu everything can be purified. So this is why Sukadeva Goswami is uh, very happy to hear this question from Maharaj Parikshit. Right? I've noted in the purport here, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur stresses that even though Diti was very envious, her heart was purified because of a devotional attitude. Another significant topic is that although Kashyapa Muni was a learned scholar and was advanced in spiritual consciousness, he nonetheless fell victim to the inducement of his beautiful wife. So these are, these are the things which are coming up in this chapter. It's important for us to appreciate. So Sukadeva Goswami is describing what happened, how Diti is full of lamentation and anger. What's her problem? Why is she lamenting? Why is she angry? Arajna. Yes? Uh, because uh, uh, Indra, because of Indra, uh, Indra wanted to kill the demons. Uh, uh, Lord Vishnu uh, killed this for Indra. So she was very angry with Indra that her two sons were killed. Yes, right. Her two sons had been killed. Why did she blame Indra? They were killed by Vishnu. Why is she blaming Indra? Maharaj, because Diti thought that Indra, you know, who was always uh, uh, 
fond of uh, material uh, uh, sense enjoyment. So he wanted to have the uh, full opulence. So uh, they see that that uh, Indra killed the two sons through Vishnu. But Indra and Vishnu are different people. My, you know, I, it's not clear to me what what why would Indra get the blame for something done by Vishnu? Anybody? Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. It's because uh, Indra was completely uh, <clears throat> deprived of uh, their services along with the other demigods to Lord Vishnu. And it was uh, Aditi and uh, who prayed uh, to Kashyapa and then finally Kashyapa gave her the opportunity that uh, she could worship the Supreme Lord and then by his grace, uh, his appearance, uh, things will be fine. And uh, here we will see that <coughs> the, uh, the Lord uh, killed Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu in, in the form of uh, Lord Nasringadev and that created a great amount of uh, anxiety in the heart of uh, Diti because uh, she felt that uh, she's completely bereft and all her sons have uh, now been completely dethroned from the heavenly places and Indra has uh, occupied that place. So because of this, there was an enviousness within the heart of uh, Diti. And that, uh, that's the reason why she had uh, put all her anger upon Indra. Well, she had already been told at the time of conception that her two children would be demons and ultimately they'd be killed by the Lord. Yeah. So she should have been more prepared for what's going to happen to her children, right? Yeah. And we also heard how she didn't like to give birth because she knew the two children were going to give trouble to the universe. So she kept them in her womb for a long time before she actually gave birth to them. Yes. But still, she's got this mentality that, you know, it seems like she could have blamed, in, she could have blamed Vishnu, but she blames Indra. Yeah? Did somebody have a response? I, it just... We, we have to consider that she has some respect for Vishnu, which she doesn't have for Indra. That Vishnu is considered supreme in the universe, whereas it, she doesn't have that same kind of respect for Indra. She's seen Indra also be a victim. She's seen him do maybe different things, his behavior sometimes has some problems, some faults. Sometimes he gets into some maya. So she, has a, she doesn't have a good opinion about Indra. And at the same time she blames him for being responsible for Vishnu killing her two sons. So Vishnu, of course, when, when there's a problem in the universe, the demigods headed by Indra, of whom Indra is the king of the demigods, he has to, he will have to approach to ask for help. So the, the Lord came. We don't actually see that in the Bhagavatam, that Indra had approached Lord Vishnu for help. We heard about Vritrasura, that he had approached Lord, the Lord to help him kill Vritrasura, but Vrit, the Lord had told him, you kill him yourself. Lord Vishnu wouldn't do it. He wanted Indra to do it himself. Let Indra take the karma. Anyway, uh, Diti certainly has this mood against, she has a vendetta, if you like, against Indra, and she wants 
revenge. So she's out to get revenge and therefore we're told how she does it, right? How does she get, how does she go about, what's her plan? She wants to have the son who would kill Indra. Is that all? Just a son who will kill Indra? Anything, any other quality about anything else about the son? Maharaja, she wanted a children like demigods who, who will live long. Right. She wanted that they should be like immortal almost, like the demigods. The demigods, they live a very long time, almost like immortal. So she wanted a son, because her, her other two sons had died, been killed, so she thinks, if I'm going to have another son, I want a son who's not going to die. So he should live a long life like the demigods, he should be immortal. And at the same time, she wants the son that he will be able to kill Indra. So, how does she go about doing it? She satisfied her husband, Kashiba. Uh, how does she satisfy him? By serving him uh, and placing him in all manner. How do you, how do you please your husband? First, we have to understand his mentality, then according to that, I have to be pleased. Okay. Yes. So, DT has to go about pleasing Kashyapa. And we're told how, how she does it. First, she's... She was... Yes, yes, Maharaj, it is explained in verse 28 that Diti always carried out Kashyapa's orders very faithfully as he desired, with service, love, humility and control with words spoken very sweetly to satisfy her husband and with smiles and glances at him. Yes, right. So, it ta must take a bit of sense control to do all that. You know, you, the, the woman really has to go out of her way to really please her husband. To, to do all of these things, acting, what does it say, acting to satisfy by her pleasing behavior. Can't do, follow all these orders faithfully, service, love, humility and control with words spoken very sweetly to satisfy her husband and with smiles and glances at him. Hmm. You can understand. She's really an actress, right? She's, <laughs> she's like an actress that you, to, to do all of this, just like you see sometimes these people in, the, in films, how they act, how they can do all of these things. They're so perfect. You see them off the stage and it's a whole different world. But when they're in the films, they look so perfect and they can behave and do all of this. So here we have Diti doing a, a, a whole drama to conquer. What's her purpose? What does she want to do? She wants to control the mind of her husband. To it says here, Diti, Diti uh, attracted his mind attracted the mind of her husband and brought it under her control. So she gets her, husband, her husband's mind under her control. <laughs> Very powerful. How powerful some women are. And Kashyapa, of course, has so many wives, but still, this one wife, she's, she was able to do this. So, the 
Kashyapa is described as being, a, of course, he's a Prajapati, he's a great scholar, he's a learned person, he's very, he must have performed many, many pious activities to get this position, to take on the, this kind of responsibility. He's one of the sons of Marichi, who's the son of, sons of Brahma, right? So, he's very high up in the universe. He's got a big position, he's a prajapati, but he also becomes controlled by Diti's artificial behavior. What is mentioned in verse 29, Diti's artificial behavior brought him under her control. So this is a not a very good situation for a, a learned scholar. But because he's controlled, because he's under her control, therefore he promises his wife that whatever you desire, I'm ready to give you. What can I do to please you? What do you want? So this is his, how he wants to repay his wife. So then text 30 goes on, we hear about in the beginning of the creation and the Sanskrit word is there, ekanta bhutani, ekanta bhutani, in the beginning of creation Lord Brahma had created living entities but they were, they were unattached, there was no, there was no other sex. <laughs> In the beginning of the creation it appears there was only the one sex. And, and so he had to create women from the better half of man's body. For women's behavior carry away a man's mind. And certainly we know it, that this is true. This is the power of a woman that she can carry away the mind of any man. So Prabhupada said actually, just like in the West, there's Western philosopher called Freud, and Freud said the basis of life is sex, that the whole world is based on, built around sex desire. And Prabhupada said he was right, this is true. And he writes about this here in, this, in the purport, in this section also. How everyone in material life are simply controlled by the agitated mind and were bewildered by the opposite sex. Anyway, women are described there, they're created from the better half of man's body. So the women are the better half of a man. Sometimes oh, we read like that, the, my better half, right? Do you introduce your wives like that? This is my better half. The wife is the better half of the man. So we, we learn about how we have to be very careful with association. And Prabhupada quotes from Srimad Bhagavatam, ninth canto, a verse which is also there in the Manu Samhita, where it talks, it warns about association. And a learned person should never be alone with his mother, his sister, or his daughter. So you can apply that. For the ladies, you will have to apply that in a little different way. A woman should not be alone with um, um, with a man who is his, her, her father or her brother or her son. A woman should not be alone with her father or her brother or her son. In the same way, a man shouldn't be alone with his mother, sister or daughter. Why? Because the senses are so strong that they can lead astray even a person advanced in knowledge. 
So this word is here in this verse is ekanta bhutani. That we should be very careful not to be alone with the opposite sex, unless, of course, one's properly married. So Kashyap is very pleased with the behaviour of his wife. Naturally, when the wife serves so nicely and pleases the husband so well, the husband wants to please her. He wants to give pay her how to please her and, and encourage her. He's thinking that if I fulfil her desire, it will encourage her to continue to serve me and to please me like this. So Kashyapa, of course, had not realised the intention of his wife. However, he praises the beauty of his wife and he says, there's, if there's whatever, whatever desires are difficult for his wife to obtain, either in this world or the next, if a husband is pleased, I have to satisfy you, I have to give you whatever you want, ask for any benediction. And then he goes on to describe the position of the husband, that the husband is like the demigod for a woman, Right, so some women and so, some men also, some men tell me, I am the guru of my wife. <laughs> they don't want their wife to take initiation from any spiritual master. They say, I am her guru. Right? And so that's okay, that's pati, pati guru, the husband guru. Generally women, chaste women, they'll think of their husband like that also, like their guru, pati. So, no, it's not wrong, but at the same time, it's, it indicates strong bodily attachment. So that attachment is allowed, but it's not good for spiritual advancement. It's not a spiritual relationship. Of course, if the husband's a devotee, then it's good. If the husband is a good devotee, then he can bring the wife also into Krishna consciousness. But if he's a devotee, he should also understand the importance of having a spiritual teacher. You, we need to be guided. We need to have some spiritual authority. So, a husband represents the Lord as an object of worship for a woman. This is Kashyapa Muni speaking like this. He's saying like that. <laughs> he's, ho my, he's hoping his wife sees him like that. So Prabhupada explains, if, if women who are usually very much attached to their husbands, worship their husbands as a representative of Vasudev, the woman benefit. So that's good. The women benefit. They worship their husband as a representative of Vasudev. They don't just worship him as an ordinary man, but they worship him as a representative of God. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada uh, summarizes again the same point. As long as one is very much attached to material sense gratification, the worship of the demigods or the worship of one's husband is recommended. So, 
If you're very much attached in the bodily concept of life, strongly, then it's okay. <laughs> you can worship your husband as... Ideally, you should worship him as a representative of Vasudeva. Now that's the difficult part. Other people, they just simply worship their husband. They don't think about what he represents. They just think, he's my husband, he's my husband, he's my God. <laughs> so Prabhupada mentions some people worship demigods. That's also all right. We worship demigods as part of the body of the Supreme Lord. But we have to remember that when you worship the demigods, that they're not supreme, that they're part of the Supreme Lord. Other people will worship demigods without knowing that. So, it, it's important to understand these statements. The husband is the guru for the, hus is the, guru for the wife. The wife can respect him. She should think of him as a representative of God. A husband, he should, be a, he should be ideal representative of God. He should follow the principles. He should be faithful to scripture, set the good example, and help the wife also in pursuing her different duties, spiritually and materially. So Kashyapa is appreciating his wife, how much, she, how nicely she's serving him and how he's respecting him. And you can see he's very enamored. His wife must be very beautiful, as described here. She has a very thin waist. She's a conscientious wife and the wife should be chaste, should abide by the orders of her husband. She should very devoutly worship her husband as a representative of Vasudeva. So, so many duties of the wife, what the wife is supposed to do. So, she, he congratulates his wife that because you have worshipped me with great devotion, considering me a representative of God, <coughs> I shall reward you fulfilling your desires with an unob which are unobtainable for an unchaste wife. And so this is Kashyapa's glorifying, appreciating the, his wife. She conquered his mind and he's appreciating so much that she's given him so much pleasure. Now he wants to satisfy her. What does she want? So now she's going to speak. And she begins text 37, what I want, and she's very frank, and she comes immediately to the point, she doesn't beat around the bush, that I lost my sons, if you want to give me a benediction, I ask you for, first of all, an immortal son who can kill Indra. So... <laughs> You just imagine, what, what kind of woman is this? You know, this is certainly not a very uh, pious thing to ask for. You want to get a benediction, you want a son who's going to kill, he's going to be a murderer. You know, this is an unusual kind of request to make, right? I want to have a son who's a murderer. You know, usually we think some, for somebody to, be, to have to kill others, it's not very good. But this is due to Diti's contaminated heart. That Diti's heart is still contaminated. She's feeling the envy, the bitterness due to the death of her two sons. And so Kashyapa hears her request and naturally he's He's shocked. Oh, alas! Now I face the danger of the impious act of killing Indra. So Kashyapa is just, he understands now he's made a great mistake. He's been tricked. 
if you like, by the clever speaking of his wife, by the clever behavior of his wife, he's become a victim of her evil intentions. So what's, what's Kashyapa going to do about it? First of all, he condemns. You know, it's interesting. How does he react to this? Does he, does he immediately turn on the wife and begin to chastise her? He actually introspects and understands that he has become a victim of the illusory material energy. And he felt, he felt that he was uh, completely cheated. And because of his behavior, he would actually glide down to hell. Mm, yes. And what does he think? What about his wife? Does he blame his wife? <clears throat> he said the personality of Godhead in the wife of in, in the in the form of a woman came to uh, give me this because I was materially attached. I like Krishna Maharaj. Yes. He didn't blame her because he thought her, her nature and all she followed her uh, thing. So he didn't blame her, he blamed himself. Right. Yes, he didn't blame her, he blamed himself. He understood, you know, this, okay, this is the nature of my, my wife. Some, sometimes women, not to speak, why so only women, sometimes men, they will have also this mood that they want to get revenge, they, somebody did something, something bad happened to them, they want to get revenge, they want to do something bad. So this is, this is a, the point here, that uh, DT is only seeing Indra. She's, she's seeing that Indra was responsible for the death of my sons. She's not thinking about her fault, <laughs> you know, that she wants to be, she wants to get Indra killed. So two wrongs don't make a right. So Diti is not seeing her wrong in her actions. Just like we say, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right? It's a common saying. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But if we follow that principle, then what will be the result? The result will be none of, none of us will have any eyes, none of us will have any teeth. So, it's... But Diti is not appreciating this. She's just thinking that my sons have been killed. I want to get revenge on this Indra. I want him to be killed. She, she saw the faults in Indra, but she, she doesn't see her own faults. She's thinking her actions will correct everything. So she's arguing like, she's talking like this. And Kashyapa Muni, he's regretting that he'd been so gullible. He was taken in by the behavior of his wife. He was thinking that my wife wants to please me and she's so attracted by me and she's smiling at me. And he wasn't thinking what was the motive behind his wife. Now Kashyapa had so many wives, so we said he had 13 wives. You would think he would be a bit wiser about the nature of women. But still somehow, you know, he's so bewildered that he'd been taken in by the behavior of his wife. And now he's regretting. Now he's regretting. So he says, I'm surely a wretched person. I will certainly go to hell. So he condemns himself. So this is a good quality in Kashyapa, that he's, he's seeing the fault in himself. He said, I could not control my senses. 
I'm not, I'm not, I don't know what was good for me. I couldn't control my senses. And then Prabhupada talks about what it means to control the, how, 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 how we have to control the senses, beginning with jiva vigam udara opasta, right? And Prabhupada talks about how people are often victimized by the uncontrolled tongue. We're given so many palatable foods, we eat so much. So we, sometimes we see like this, uh, before marriage people were quite thin, but somehow after marriage they put on a lot of weight. They get new bodies, they become so big and healthy looking. We wonder, my goodness, what happened? No, they got married, oh. And, and they eat so much. So they eat so much, they eat a lot, and then when the, when the tongue is uncontrolled, then the other senses are also uncontrolled. And you fall a victim, and you fall into sense gratification. Uncontrolled senses. So this happens very easily in householder life. Prabhupada would say, Householder life is like going to a feast and fasting, right? Going to a feast and fasting. So householders also, when they would ask Prabhupada, what is our duty? And Prabhupada would always reply, he would say, you have to go to the door and you call out, food is now ready in my home. Anybody who wants to take food, please come and eat. Right? And Prabhupada talked about his own home. He said when he was a child, he said they would never eat alone. They always had guests. He said his father every day would bring guests home to take food in their home. So he said this householder life. The doors open, anybody like to come, come and eat. And we like, like to give, to feed the, feed the other people, even especially uninvited guests. The uninvited guests is like a demigod coming to test our charity. But if you go to people, sometimes they'll say, why have you come here? Who told you to come here? Why you come here disturbing me? The culture is gone. Anyway, Kashapa is regretting his situation and in the purport, Prabhupada talks extensively about controlling the, the tongue and controlling the senses. talks about brahmachari life, student life, important that people should be trained, the beginning of life. There has to be training to control the senses. If people go through, have proper training from the beginning of life, then it's so much easier. If somebody is trained in the beginning to control the senses, then they can make a good householder. And similarly, women also, they also need training. They have to be trained in chastity and to be faithful to their husband, how to serve their husband. So this kind of training is important. If from the very beginning, if men and women are trained like this, then there will be no problems in family life. Today there's so much divorce because men and women cannot control their senses. And they simply argue and fight and quarrel with each other and then divorce. But when they have proper training in the beginning of life, when they're properly trained, then they can live together peacefully. So at the end of Purport, text 40, Prabhupada writes, Therefore, householder life in this Kali Yuga is extremely dangerous unless both the wife and husband take to Krishna consciousness. Yeah. So this is the point. They must be 
there again in the purport it says, if, if the wife is faithful to her husband and follows him in such life, the relationship between husband and wife is very desirable. Right? The man is trained in Bhagavad Dharma and the wife follows her husband and then the relationship is very good and they will both benefit. The man should be a staunch Vaishnava and the wife should be a faithful follower of her husband. Then when the husband goes back to Godhead, the wife will follow her husband back to Godhead. So the, the training begins from childhood. Prabhupada talks about that, the, the brahmachari. Komara charit prakno dharmam bhagavatam yaha. The beginning of life. Get the good training. So, of course, Iskon had a very bad reputation about uh, householder couples, marriages breaking up. But over the years, there's been a lot of improvement, and we have some very nice uh, organizations now. There's one service is called Grihasta Vision Team, GVT, Grihasta Vision Team, and and these are a group of senior devotees. And they help young devotees prepare for family life. They prepare them for entering into family life. Because often coming from outside the Vedic culture, people are not trained up very well for family life. And we have all the misconceptions of what married life is like. So the Grihastha Vision team people, they arrange courses and seminars to help people to prepare themselves for married life and so that they will not have difficulty. Of course in Hindu culture you have that kind of culture already by nature and often the marriages that are arranged by the family that's also very good. So when the, when the mothers and fathers or the in-laws when they're all cooperative then they can greatly help to make the marriage successful. However, we're seeing here in Srimad Bhagavatam, this is like the heavenly planets, higher planets, Diti and Aditi and Kashyapa, even here they have problems. So it's described here about Kashyapa is describing how the woman's face is so attractive. But then he says, the woman's heart is a different nature. Well, the woman's face is very sweet and beautiful, and the words were very nice, but the heart is very sharp, like the blaze of a razor. So who can understand the dealings of a woman? Now for the women, you should also think of the men like this. If we study a man's heart, we can understand it to be extremely sharp, like the blade of a razor. Here, the man is speaking. So women can also speak the same way. Men also have their problems. In these circumstances, who could understand the dealings of a man? It's not that all the faults are with the women only. Men also have our, we also have our problems. But here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the message is mainly presented for the men and warning the men. Women have to understand it in their own way. So what are some of the faults? In women, what, what, does, what are some of the faults and what are some of the good qualities in women that we see here, which are described in relation to women? What can you say? Maharaj. In these 
a section we have seen that how Diti was quite faithful in terms of serving her husband and pleasing in all possible ways. Though the intent of uh, such uh, thing was completely undercover, but the way how she followed and pleased her husband is one of the very good qualities. Although her motive was not good, you say it was a good quality. That she... Yes. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Just uh, in two words, uh, sometimes she may look so attractive and pleasing, but if she is not a devotion, she can uh, uh, distract his uh, path. It will be very dangerous for him. Oh, so. Uh, she may have beauty, but no bhakti. Yeah. So we have to, one should not simply be bewildered by the external features. Right? We should not, we should not put a, a, a great emphasis on the external features of the person. Here he is comparing with the, with the blade of razor. If, if, if you touch it, it will harm you. Like that, just by seeing the beauty, if you get attracted, it may harm your progress. Okay. That's what here you can understand. So this would be a, a fault on the, on, the, on the part of a woman, that she may have some material motive, right? Are there, what are some good qualities in women? She is gentle, she can take care of the husband like a mother, she can feed him and she will serve him. Okay. She can become a nice advisor when it's needed and she can give support when he's in distress. <laughs> she and can... as, a good, as a devotee, she can support her husband's endeavors in the path of devotion. She can encourage her husband in the path of devotion. Yeah. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. On, at the, at this, on this juncture, there is some uh, an aspect of a little concern and a debate is that uh, are the parents uh, giving adequate training for their uh, daughters to get properly oriented for the grihastha life? Because in, in the modern day, we see uh, so many kinds of uh, demands that actually starts to get uh, in place after the marriage which gets into one's life and so the men are generally confused or they are under pressure and the demands of the girls are also very high even including in devotee circle we see this happening by so uh, the point is that are the parents responsible enough to train their daughters, equally of course the sons also, to be uh, grihastha oriented, which helps their bhakti as all in all. So I would like to hear from you on that uh, perspective, Maharaj. Well, I would think a lot of it has to do with the parents themselves, that their own example has to be there. That the children see how their parents act and how their parents deal with each other and they learn from them. So the example of the parents themselves is the best training for their daughters. If the mother and father, if they, if they themselves are not uh, always concerned with so many material things and a lot of sense gratification and if they live together peacefully and cooperate with each other and the home is happy, then that's the best training for their daughters, that they see how their mother and father lived together and how they were happy, how they cooperated with each other and they learn from them. It's a natural training, it's not like the they should need a lot of training, but it's just there, just in the fact that they grow up in a natural home 
with the mother and father and they see the mother and father interact and that is the best training for the daughter. So the parents' orientation towards devotional life and their own personal behavior is the one which gives the greatest impact. That's how, what you are trying to summarize, Maharaj. That, I think it's very important. I think it's really very important. It's very unfortunate today that so many children grow up in unnatural homes. Often it's uh, just with the mother or sometimes even just with the father because the, hu the husband and wife, they, the mother and father, they divorced and separated or living apart. There's so many broken homes. And this is not, this is not good for bringing up children. It's an unnatural home life, unnatural atmosphere at home. What is important is that they see the mother and father and they, they see the mother and father live together happily, peacefully and cooperate with each other, encourage each other, share the issues and responsibilities. I would consider that to be very important. Somebody said to me recently, they said that, you know, today the women, they all have so many demands, they want so much what they want, money, they want, they, they expect their husband to be rich, they expect their husband to have good job, they expect their husband to do, have so many things. Well, I said, well, it's practical. I said, women are practical. The man's job is to protect the husband protect the wife. At the time of marriage, it, the woman is given to the man and he has to protect her. And the way in which he will protect her is by, by providing for her. He has to provide for her different things like cloth and uh, a home and so many different things which are essential for the, for the woman. So women are practical today, they, they're going to get married, they don't want to marry, they can't marry a man who doesn't have a home, doesn't have anywhere to live. Where are we going to live? They marry a man who doesn't have any job, he can't earn any money, how are they going to manage? If they have children, how will they ever bring up a family? These are serious problems. So, you know, you can't blame women for looking at these things, they have to be practical. Of course, you could say, well, some, t some people go overboard, they want so much money or they want so, they demand so much. Um, then maybe, well, <laughs> they, they, they know what they want, they know their own standards. But we have to expect there will be some issues like that. So family life is important. Generally most people are in families. They do get married, they have a husband or they have a wife, they want to have children. So it's important that they should know how to live in family life, how to be peaceful, how to minimize the demands of the body, to control the senses. So it's training. There is some training required and cert certainly Prabhupada is talking about training here. Uh, he was talking, men should be trained as brahmacharya. In the beginning if they're trained as brahmacharya, if they're not trained as brahmacharya then it's very difficult for them. They go into family life. They won't be satisfied with one woman. One wife is not enough. They're womanizers. They like to go around to other women. They get bored with one woman. So men are like, if, if you marry someone who's not trained in brahmachari life, who's not got control over his mind and senses, then you have difficulty. And same, the same with women. If a woman is not trained to be chaste, and we will hear what, what women are supposed to do to be chaste. 
to execute this kind of vow like what's going to be described here in this section of the Bhagavatam. We're going to hear how, about how Diti did this Pum Savana Vrat, how the women have to put, follow this Vrat. They have to be very chaste and very sense controlled. They have to cover their body properly. They have to have their hair tied. They cannot just have their hair hanging all of everywhere. And they have to wear ornaments and like this. There's so many things are required. So it's a challenge. All right, so in this section we hear about women and we're told that the greatest danger, very dangerous thing, is to hear a woman's voice, that it can be very disturbing for somebody if they're a sannyasi or something. Right? Prabhupada said, as taught by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, a woman singing is dangerous because it can make a sannyasi fall a victim to the woman. <laughs> Sannyas means giving up the company of women. But if a sannyasi hears the voice of a woman and sees her beautiful face, he certainly becomes attracted and is sure to fall down. It's a good job we don't have too many sannyasis. Dangerous. So we have to be very careful, that the, that's the point. But at the end of the purport, Prabhupada talks about how, uh, he said, sometimes people condemn our Krishna consciousness movement. You see, one of the different, one of the things which Prabhupada did with the Krishna consciousness movement was, he allowed women also to become members of the Krishna consciousness movement. Previously, you know, like Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada's time, it was just men and a few old widows. But in the course of time, with Prabhupada going to the West and the young women there all wanted to join, so Prabhupada let them also join. So sometimes people would criticize that, oh, Hare Krishna movement, they have so many men and so many women all mixing together. So Prabhupada said, well, we have to give the women also a chance. Women also want to become Krishna conscious. And Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita, Striyo Vaishastatasudras Tepi Yanti Parangatim, that even though one be a woman, they can also achieve the supreme perfection. And Prabhupada was very grateful for all the work done by women. They did a lot. And we see even today in our Krishna consciousness movement, we have women who are temple presidents. You go to America, for example, in USA, a number of the centers there have ladies who are temple presidents, like uh, Alachua, uh, uh, Potomac, uh, Washington, and, and there's different centers. I'm not, I don't go to America myself, but I've heard there are a number of centers there where the women are in charge. Women run the temple. Women are temple presidents. We have a woman GBC, the, the governing body commission. There's a lady on the GBC, Malati Madaji. She's on the GBC. And uh, we have also ladies doing things like giving courses, giving seminars, They're big preachers, we know, of course, you have Urval, uh, Urmal, Urmila Mataji come there and she's giving seminars, you know, she's very active, traveling and preaching and she's very scholarly, very wonderful devotee. And we have, the, they're even thinking, there's a lot of propaganda just now that women should also be gurus. They want ladies to also be gurus. Already ladies are giving things, like, doing things like giving shiksha, they're giving instruction, but they, would, they, they like that the women should also be giving diksha. It's, it's a, it's, that's 
quite controversial. Of course, in India, we don't usually, they don't want that. It's a bit different. In, in India is a bit, bit more conservative or a bit more uh, traditional, and they don't like the idea at all of having women gurus. And you see in India, generally, we don't see women on the altar offering arti. But you go to the West, you go to temples in the West, you see women there offering arti and doing the puja. So we, we try as much as we can to you know, let women also have an opportunity. Certainly Prabhupada wanted it. Let women also. Women also do a lot of preaching. They do a lot of work, they, they do a lot of service for the Krishna Consciousness Movement. We have many lady, nice lady preachers. If, if the women were not in our movement, our movement wouldn't be what it is today. We couldn't, we could never have so many centers and so much activities. So the women certainly play a major role, they play a big role in our movement. We have to recognize them. So Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, We therefore request all the members of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, both men and women, not to be attracted by bodily features, but only to be attracted by Krishna. Then everything will be alright. Otherwise, there will be danger. So this is a problem. If we're in the bodily consciousness, if we're only looking at the body, <laughs> that's not a spiritual movement. So we have to be, we have to not focus on the bodily features. We have to hear and we have to inquire. And so there's many important lessons to be mentioned here. So Kashyapa is speaking about some of the problems which come up in dealing with the opposite sex. And he talks about text, text 42, to satisfy their own interests, what they will do. That men, as if men were most dear to them, but no one is actually dear to them. Women are supposed to be very saintly, but for their own interests, they can kill even their husbands, sons or brothers, or cause them to be killed by others. <laughs> so, the same can be said about men, not only women. It's not only women who could do this. Men can also do this. Men or women. We have this problem. We're controlled. Of course, this is a bodily concept of life. We have to come to the spiritual platform. We have to cultivate spiritual practice. We have to chant and hear. We shouldn't be influenced by these kind of material desires. And Prabhupada talks in the purport about how women need to be protected by men. Why do they need to be protected by men? What's the danger? What do they need to be protected from? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they need to be protected from being exploited freely by other men. <laughs> well, yeah, that's there. That's one thing, but that's not Prabhupada's intention here. He's got another intention. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Now here he is there telling uh, we should protect the women to not to become self-interested and selfish. Right. Actually, the first point Nanda Kishore Prabhu was saying women should be protected from other men. But if a woman is chaste, that should not be a problem. A chaste woman, first of all, she'll, she'll dress herself properly, she'll cover her body and so on like that. And she won't associate freely with other men. So she should not really have the problem of other men chasing after her and trying to 
corrupt her, if she behaves properly in the proper manner. So what is it that the protection which she needs is, as Mariji said, she has to be protected from uh, from her own selfishness. Prabhupada says, women must be cared for so that they will not be free to manifest their natural tendency for gross selfishness. Gross selfishness. Our own selfish nature. What we want. We're thinking what we, I want and we want sense gratification. I have senses. I want to satisfy my senses. We have to protect our women from that. We have that tendency to be selfish and we want, to, we want sense gratification. And pra so Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, such natural instincts of a woman or a man are manifested only in the bodily conception of life. Whether either a man or a woman is advanced in spiritual consciousness, the bodily conception of life pra practically vanishes. So if, if, we, if we give people Krishna consciousness, then this bodily conception will not be there. This is the point. If we get people, we train people properly how to chant and how to worship, to understand the spiritual knowledge, to read Shastra, then this selfish, this bodily consciousness will not be there. This is the solution to the problem. The women have to be protected because, as we say, women have, they have a nature. And that nature is to be selfish. Sometimes when we're children we can be very selfish. And our parents will always tell, don't be selfish, share what you've got, be, you know, be kind-hearted, be considerate. So this is important. Prabhupada continues, uh, the Krishna consciousness movement is so beneficial that it can very easily counteract the contamination of material nature which results from one's possessing a material body. <laughs> so we have a material body, we have material desires, we have to counteract it. We have to know how to take up Krishna consciousness. So at the end of the purport Prabhupada said, a man should be trained to be a first-class devotee of Lord Krishna and a woman should be trained to be a very chaste follower of her husband. It's a difficult situation for women today because women go to work. Most, a lot of women go out to work and when they go out to work, they work with men and they're, they're often not working where their husband is. The husband's away in another company and the wife is in some different place and the wife is there, her, the man's wife is there in the company of so many other men. It's not a healthy situation for women. It doesn't help a woman's chastity to have to work all day in an office with a lot of other men. But this is what happens in the world today. Of course we say women's liberation. Women's liberation meant that the women have to go out to work. The women thought they were getting something good when they were to women's liberation. Men and women are equal. But what does it mean? Women also go out to work. The, man's, the man works, the woman also works. But it's a woman who has the baby. It's a woman who gets pregnant. She has the baby, she has to take care of the children. And at the same time she's working. 
it's very difficult situation for women. A woman nowadays, they, what they have to do, they, they, how they have to work, so many things they have to do. So actually what should happen is women should be at home. They're meant to take care of the home. But nowadays all women, they like to go out to work. They don't like to be at home. These are some problems. Anyway, Kashyapa, his wife is at home and still he's got a problem. At least Kashyapa understands Indra doesn't deserve to be killed. So he's thinking how to, how to overcome that. What's what Kashyapa's solution to the problem? How is he going to avoid killing Indra? What's he going to do? Yes. He wants to make a Diti a devotee. Yes. He wants to make Diti a devotee. He wants to purify her, right? Purify her heart. In Prabhupada's purport of text 43, he said, I shall train her in such a way that instead of always thinking of how to kill Indra, she will become a Vaishnava, a devotee of Krishna. If she agrees to follow the rules and regulations of the Vaishnava principles, the unclean core of her heart will certainly be cleansed. So how to purify the, the core of her heart? Simply by Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is so powerful it can purify even the dirtiest class of men and transform them into the topmost Vaishnavas. Right? We have our Krishna consciousness movement as proof of this statement that so many of us, we were all very dirt, the lowest, dirtiest class of men but we can become devotees We're by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya's movement. So what is the problem with Diti's heart? What has she got in her heart? Envy Maharaj. Right, envy, right, envy. So? What, what do we learn about envy from Srimad Bhagavatam? Is Srimad Bhagavatam for the envious? No, Nirmat Saranam Satam. Right, Nirmat Saranam Satam. Was Arjuna envious? Arjuna was not envious, Maharaj. Right. Because you're not envious of me, I'm speaking this knowledge to you. So envy, this, this is the beginning of this giving Diti the Vaishnava teachings, making Diti into a Vaishnava. It begins by getting her to give up this envy, this violent mood, this nasty nature towards others, being spiteful or hating others, that has to be removed before we can take up Krishna consciousness. So that is the first thing, to cleanse the heart. How are we going to do it? How are we going to cleanse the heart? Yes, the holy name, the power of the holy name. Yes, Lord Chaitanya has come to cleanse everyone's heart. Right, the holy name can save us from that. Very important, therefore, to give the holy name, to get people to chant. Prabhupada said the beginning of Krishna consciousness is the chanting of the holy name. Once people start to chant, then they begin their Krishna consciousness. So Kashyapa is thinking like that. 
how to make Diti into a devotee. So he tells his wife that, Oh, no, I will give you a son who will kill Indra. No problem. However, condition, right? Condition. You have to follow what I'm going to follow my instructions for one year. For one year. Now, sometimes we tell people, you just follow four principles, chant 16 rounds. For, if you can do it for one year, that's really good. We tell, if you just do it for three months, it will make such a big difference. You can feel it in three months if you can just do it. Even one month if you can do it. Follow four principles, chant 16 rounds every day. You will feel the difference. So, Kashyap is telling Diti, for one year, you have to do this. He's going to give her a special, this, this uh, special vrat to follow, so that she can get a son who will either kill Indra or be a follower of Indra. So he warns her, if you deviate from following the principle, you will get a son who will be favorable to Indra. You get a son who is a follower of Indra. So it's clever word jugglery. Kashyapa is quite very intelligent man, and he's got it all. He's got it worked out. So Diti is happy. She she accepts. All right. Just tell me what I have to do. What I shouldn't do. Tell me. I want to know clearly. And Prabhupada talks about. Here, you see, by nature, a woman wants to be a follower of a man. It's a woman's nature. Where is the woman? It's an unusual woman who doesn't want to be a follower of a man. That's an unusual. You get sometimes these women, but they're unusual. They're the exception. Most women, generally, they like to be a follower of a man. Therefore, if the man is good, the woman can be trained for a good purpose. So this is a, important. You know. The woman wants, will, will, a woman will find a man, she'll want a man. And so if the man is good, then the women can also be trained for a good purpose. The, the man has to be good, and then the wife will also follow the husband. So Kashyapa speaking, she's going to tell his wife what to do. First thing, do not be violent or cause harm to anyone, right? In other words, she has to give up this envy, this bad feeling towards others. This is so harmful for our Krishna consciousness. If we hold any grudges or bitterness in our hearts towards others, this has to go. This is not going to allow us to progress in spiritual life. And then, do not curse anyone. Do not speak lies. Don't cut your nails and hair. Don't touch impure things like skulls and bones. So, Kashyapa Muni's instructions are that his wife not be envious, indicate this is the first stage of advancement in Krishna consciousness, giving up this envy. Of course, this is the most difficult thing. This is the hard, the biggest challenge to get people to give up this envy. Not easy. Easy said, not easy. But you have to do it. If you want something, this is what the, this is a price Diti has to pay. She wants, she wants something, this is what she has to do. So Kashyap is really a clever man. More rules, what she has to do, she wear clothes which are properly washed, put, never put on a garland that's already been worn, don't be angry, do not even associate with wicked people. Association, very important. And then eating, you have to eat 
but he's, he's telling her all the things she shouldn't do, right? We usually tell people what you should do. Right? Don't eat leftover food. Don't eat prasadam and the demigods. Don't eat meat and fish and filthy things. So this is all common knowledge to devotees, not difficult for us to understand. So Kashyapa Muni is giving these kind of negative instructions, what she shouldn't do. This is like the Yama, right? There's Yama, yama and then there's Niyama. Yama is what you don't do, Niyama is what you do. And then after eating you must wash and don't eat in the evening. Don't sleep in the evening, that was it. don't sleep in the evening and you should not go out in the evening or with your hair loose, you should not go out unless you are properly decorated with ornaments, you should not leave the house unless you are very grave and are sufficiently covered. And Prabhupada talks about women wearing mini skirts. He said that <laughs> how women in Western world sometimes they wear these short skirts and he said this is not good. If we, when, we, when people come to Krishna consciousness then they learn what is the proper dress, what is the proper attire. Don't lay down without having washed your feet. Don't be naked and don't sleep during the sunrise or sunset. Different instructions are given here. And then if one is trained to honour and worship all the cows and the brahmanas, that's also mentioned. And that's of course an important thing for one who wants to progress in spiritual life, giving proper respect to the cows and the brahmanas. In the modern society, we're so disrespectful to cows and brahmanas. Prabhupada said, cow protection ensures sufficient food production, food sufficient food prepared with milk which is needed for an advanced civilization. Milk is necessary to develop the, the brain. Nowadays you've got things like these vegan people, they don't want to drink milk at all, even if you have your own cows, they, we tell them we have our own cows, we have our own Ahimsa cows, we have Ahimsa milk at Bhaktivedanta Manor, Ahimsa milk, but they say, no, no, you can't take any milk. But the cow, it's meant to give milk and we give grass. The cow gets grass to eat and she gives her milk. So milk is very important for the development of the health of the brain, the body, Cow and cows are important for the society, but people don't know how to respect these things. So then different conditions are given, Kashyapa Muni is instructing, he gives her mantras to chant. If you perform this ceremony, text 54, called Pumsavana, adhering to the vow with faith for one year, you will give birth to a son destined to kill Indra. But if there is any discrepancy in your vow, the son will be a friend to Indra. So Indra hears all this, Indra is thinking what to do. So Indra knew about this and he makes arrangements. All right. Well, first of all, we heard Diti, when she, she accepted all the conditions 
And then with great jubilation, she becomes pregnant, she takes the semen from Kashyapa, and she's pregnant, she con conceived, she's conceived, and so she's carrying the child, and at the same time she's going to do all of this worship, she's going to follow this vow. So Indra is aware of what's happening, and Indra is going to take steps, he wants to come and he wants to try to do some harm, right? Engage himself in the service of Deity. And he's, Indra is there, and what's he doing? He's bringing her flowers, he's bringing fruits, he's bringing roots, he's bringing wood for the yagya, and he's doing all, he's doing nice menial service. He's Indra, the king of heaven but he's bringing all of these things for Diti. So, Diti, she's doing devotional service, what about Indra? What's he doing? Is he also doing devotional service? Yes, serving the devotee. Yeah, he's serving the devotee, right? You get even more benefit when you serve the devotee. So Indra is also getting purified by serving Diti. Diti is doing devotional service because she's following the brat and Indra is serving Diti so he's also getting some mercy, he's also getting great benefit. So he's watching Diti and he doesn't find any fault with her and it goes on for a long time, There's, couldn't find any fault with her. And then what happens? What did she do wrong? She, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yeah? She didn't uh, clean her mouth, hand and feet after taking prasad one time. And what did she do? She just went to sleep directly. Yeah, she took rest, right? She took rest without washing. So, Indra knew, right? So what does Indra do? She had become thin, she become weak, she was doing the vow and she became tired so she neglected, she forgot to wash her hands and mouth and then she's open, she's vulnerable. So Indra uses his yoga siddhis, he's got yoga powers. So anima siddhi, to make himself very, very small and he goes into her womb, right? She's asleep and Indra goes into her womb by his yoga powers, he enters into her womb and he brings his weapon with him, he brings his thunderbolt weapon somehow. The thunderbolt weapon must have become small also. I don't know how he could go into there, take his thunderbolt weapon into her womb. Anyway, with the help of his thunderbolt, he cuts the embryo into seven pieces. And we're, it's to, we're told they appeared like glowing gold. And he cuts the embryo into seven pieces. And at that time, different living beings began crying. The seven places, they, they were living entities entered into each, each of the parts, seven parts. Originally there was only one, but the one became seven. And, they, and Indra told them, do not cry, because they were crying. So Indra has to tell them, do not cry. But he cuts them into seven pieces again. So seven sevens are 49. So this way you've got 49 living entities. And Prabhupada explains in the purple, he said, just like plants, you can cut a plant or sometimes you take a branch from the tree and you put the branch of the tree in the ground and it will grow. So the same way with plants, you can take plants and you cut plants into pieces and each piece of the plant will grow. So Indra had cut the embryo into 49 pieces and they all became 
the Maruts. The 49 became the Maruts. And they, they told Indra, we are your brothers. Why are you trying to kill us? Indra was thinking he's going to kill, but he couldn't kill them. Why not? Why couldn't he kill them? Hare Krishna Maharaj, they were protected by the Lord. Why? Because of Diti's service, devotional service. Right, because Diti had been doing devotional service. And remember, Diti wanted children, he, she wanted a child who would be like the demigods, who would not die. So, they didn't die. Her benediction was fulfilled because she'd been doing devotion. But what about the fact that she made a mistake? That she didn't wash her hands and everything? Didn't that matter? Hare Krishna Maharaj and Bhagavad Gita Lord says like sometimes devotee falls down. Shipram Bhavati Satamatma. Did she fall down? For a mistake happened from her God, it's like a fall down. Yeah, in, in this matter, there's a verse actually, which is quoted by Jiva Goswami from the Bhagavatam, from the 8th canto, in relation to Sukracharya and the Bali Maharaj. 8th uh, canto, 23rd chapter, verse 16, there's a verse there, which Jiva, Goswa, Jiva Goswami quotes, and he said, even, it says that even there's some imperfections in chanting mantras or performing vows, this is, but by chanting the holy name, everything is perfect. By chanting the holy name, all the, any deviations, any imperfections, any, de, any uh, faults in performing the vow, they're all nullified by the chanting of the holy name. The chanting of the holy name is so powerful, it nullifies everything, any kind of errors or deviations which have, may have been there. So actually, Diti was perfect <laughs> because she'd been doing devotional service and she, had to, she was chanting the holy name. And so there was no fault on her part. So Indra saw that actually they were his devoted followers. He said to them, if you are all my brothers, you have nothing more to fear from me. Of course, if they're brothers, they're the Maruts. The Maruts are demigods, right? They have some function which they, the Maruts perform. And so Indra is the king of the demigods, so they're his brothers, so he's happy to have them and he's going to take them all to heaven with him. And Sukadeva Goswami is speaking to Maharaj Parikshit. He tells Maharaj Parikshit, he said, just like you were in the womb and you got burned by the Brahmastra weapon of Ashwatthama, but then Lord Krishna entered the womb and you were saved. Of course, Lord Krishna is already there in the womb. He doesn't have to enter the womb, but Lord Krishna saved him. And he said, in the same way, this one embryo became 49 and they were all saved by the mercy of the Supreme Lord. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. <coughs> when Indra knew that they are uh, his brother, why did he cut them? What, is, was there any reason? Well, remember, he didn't know that they were his brothers initially. Initially, remember, Indra thought Diti is doing this vow to get a son who is supposed to be my enemy to kill me. So Indra thought, this is it, this, is, this child is going to be born, he's supposed to kill me. So he thought, he's thinking, I will kill him. But he couldn't kill. He couldn't kill. But he, he, he cut the embryo into pieces. And then he cut each piece into more pieces. They ended up with 49 pieces. And 
spirit soul entered into each one of these pieces. So that's how you go, we have the 49 Maruts. So Indra, it, he, he did have the evil intention initially, but then he found out that, you know, they, they told him, don't kill us, we are, we are all your brothers. So when he heard that they were his brothers, then he gave up his violence. Then he stopped trying to kill them. Actually, he couldn't kill them because Diti had done devotional service. So by her purity of devotional service, for, she'd done it for nearly one year. She hadn't quite completed the year, but nearly one year she'd been doing devotional. So she'd become very purified, very powerful. And that's how these demigods came from her womb. Although she's Diti, and usually she gives birth to the, di the, 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 the demons, the Daichas. But by, because of her association with devotional service, because of her performance of devotional service, she gave birth to children who were demigods, who had all good qualities. Is it clear? Yes, Madam. Thank you. So we're told, text 66 and 67, if one worships the personality of Godhead, the original person, even once, he receives the benefit of being promoted to the spiritual world and possessing the same bodily features as Vishnu. Diti worshipped Lord Vishnu for almost one year, adhering to a great vow. Because of such strength in spiritual life, the 49 Maruts were born. How then is it wonderful that the Maruts, although born from the womb of Diti, became equal to the demigods by the mercy of the Supreme Lord? Yeah. Indra didn't know they were de these, these were the Maruts. When he, was, when he went into the womb, he thought, this is a child who's my enemy, who's going to be born to kill me. So he thought that he would try to kill the child. But he found out later, as he cut them into pieces, then they told them, don't kill us, we're your brothers. So then Indra had a change of heart. So Diti had become completely purified, says here. Uh, but when she got up from her bed and she saw there were 49, 49 children, her 49 sons, all as brilliant and as fire, and were in friendship with Indra, therefore she was puzzled. Actually, it said, therefore, she was very pleased. She was pleased. You, we can see how Diti and Indra, they all became, the both of them became purified. That initially, they had a very different mood. Their intention was something violent and nasty. But they've become purified. So Diti asked Indra, how did I get so many children? I did a vow just to get a son to kill the Adityas. How did I get so many children? And he's your friend. He's supposed to be your enemy. <laughs> so Diti, and Diti is very honest. She tells Indra, I prayed for one son. Now there's 49. Please tell me what happened. So Indra is very honest also, and he tells Diti that he said, he explains there, text 71, because I was grossly blinded by selfish interests, I lost sight of religion. 
So again, the selfishness, you see, Indra was selfish, Diti was selfish. This is the problem. We have to get rid of that selfishness. And how to overcome that selfishness? By practicing spiritual life. And Indra says, when I understood that you were observing a great vow in spiritual life, I wanted to find some fault in you. So, did he find a, when I found such a fault, I cut the embryo to pieces. However, Prabhupada explains, both of them, instead of being enemies, freely spoke the truth. This is the qualification that results from contact with Vishnu. Diti had wanted to harm Indra, and Indra wanted to harm Diti's child. But now they've become friends, they've both become good people. And Prabhupada quotes that verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Yashyasti Bhaktir Bhagavati Akinchana. All the good qualities are there in one who is a devotee. By developing devotional service, all the good qualities come and all the bad qualities are gone. So that envy was removed by contact with devotional service. This is the power of devotional service. Because of being touched by worship of Vishnu, both Diti and Indra were purified. So Indra himself says, in text 73, himself says, when I saw they were still alive, I was certainly struck with wonder. Indra thought he was killing them. He said, I was struck with wonder. Then, but then he says, I decided that this was a secondary result of your having regularly executed devotional service in worship of Lord Vishnu. Just understand how powerful the process of devotional service is. That even Indra was there in the womb trying to kill the child. He couldn't kill them. But he's intelligent. He could understand. This is the result. He's, he calls it secondary result. The primary result is developing devotion for the Supreme Lord. But the secondary result was that the children, the child in her womb could not be killed, could not be harmed, because she'd taken shelter of the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada quotes a famous verse from the end of Bhagavad Gita, where there is Krishna and Arjuna, there will be victory, morality, extraordinary power and opulence. Inconceivable, it's inconceivable how powerful devotional service is and how it acted. Prabhupada says at the end of the purport, this is the omnipotency of the Supreme Lord. For one who pleases the Supreme Lord, no achievement is wonderful. Everything is possible for him. Right? This is wonderful. This is the nature of the Supreme Lord. Prabhupada told us, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. So we, we can see here the impossible becoming possible. So, uh, Continuing here, Lord Krishna wants to fulfill the desires of his devotees. The devotee doesn't want anything material from the Lord, but Krishna fulfills all their desires. Krishna knows the heart of the devotee. Just like Dhruva Maharaj, he had desires in his heart and Krishna fulfilled his desires. He gave him a kingdom greater than his father. Dhruva didn't want it, 
but Krishna gave it to him anyway. We have to be very careful what we desire. Krishna remembers all of our desires from before, when we, before we became devotees. Krishna can fulfill all these desires. We don't want it. We may not want it. Krishna, you, you didn't want it. You, have to, you wanted it before. Now you take it. So Krishna knows what's all of our desires from the past. We have to be very careful what we desire. We have to really get rid of all these material desires. And Prabhupada talks about opulence, how Krishna fulfills the desires and gives opulence. He said, a karmi's opulence is destroyed, but the opulence of a devotee is never destroyed. A devotee becomes more and more opulent as he increases his devotional service to the Lord. The more we do service for Krishna, the more opulence comes. We have to be very careful to use all of it for the service of Krishna. So Prabhupada had that experience that as he was preaching Krishna consciousness, in the beginning he was struggling. He went to America with nothing, but gradually, gradually Krishna gave him more and more. So Krishna can give the devotee. He Prabhupada said Krishna gave the Pandavas the whole world. How many days? How many days did it take for the Pandavas to get the whole world? 18 days. Yes, right. The battle of Kurukshetra, 18 days. Krishna gave them the whole world. However, devotee is very careful. An intelligent man will never aspire to become a devotee to achieve material happiness. Material happiness, that is available even in hell. <laughs> we don't want that kind of happiness. So, uh, Prabhupada talks, he said, a pure devotee never begs the Lord for material happiness in the shape of riches, followers, a good wife or a good husband or even mukti. The Lord promises, however, yoga kshema vahamiyaham, I voluntarily bring everything necessary for my service. So Indra tells DT, I'm a fool, and he asks for forgiveness. I've committed offenses to you, I'm a fool, please forgive me. And DT, she's satisfied by Indra's good behavior. And in this way, with her permission, he went to heaven with his brother Samaruts. So this is Diti's vow to kill King Indra. And there's one, just one short chapter remaining, performing the Pumsavana ritualistic ceremony. We'll hear the details, how to perform that ceremony. A short chapter, just only some 20, 20 something verses. Are there any questions or comments? Anything to be discussed? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Only one, my doubt is uh, even though uh, Indra uh, did that uh, um, abominable act of uh, cutting the womb of Mother Diti. Uh, how Lord left him, Maharaj, without any punishment? Just by asking the forgiveness from her? Well, the, although he cut them, nobody died. Uh, okay. And instead she got 49 sons instead of one son. 
So you may, you may not like the idea of having 49 sons, but <laughs> I think, I think that in, in their situation, we're quite happy. You, and remember, before she's giving birth to demons, but now these are demigods. And so it's quite, quite a welcome change for, uh, for Diti, I think, that she can give birth to demigods. And she has to really thank Indra for this, you know, although not but the, except. But the thought of Indra is disturbing me. How he could think that? How he could what? How he could think that to go enter into the mother's womb and cut the womb into pieces. It's really disturbing to hear that, actually. <laughs> Well, he'd already gone into the into the mouth of uh, he'd been in the mouth of Britasura. <laughs> he, was, he was getting some experience going inside different living entities. But by his yoga powers, he could do that. Certainly, you know, yeah, he figures you. Yeah, this is a child. He, he doesn't want to do any harm to Diti. He just wanted to, the child who's going to be born from her womb. That was a danger to him. And so he could enter into the womb and kill the baby. And that he didn't think it was such a big problem for him. With his yoga powers, he could do this. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh -huh. This, uh, this uh, repeatedly reminds us that how precarious is the position of Indra and mm -hmm. how quickly he actually becomes envious of uh, even uh, any sight of a challenge. Just uh, uh, to recall about this episode, uh, previously it was the uh, Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu's uh, being killed uh, by the Lord that was uh, stated. And after that, uh, during that period of time of Hiranyakashipu, Prahlad was born, and before Prahlad was being born, he attempted to also kill the child within the womb of Kayadu. So uh, it appears that uh, at every single moment uh, for him uh, to safeguard his position, his power is the primary thing, and he doesn't really care for how and what methods he uses this. And, uh, uh, and but because the process that is being adapted by various personalities. In relationship with the Lord, which is giving protection, is what is being highlighted again and again in the Bhagavatam. Even though Indra was, Indra is actually being used as a scapegoat, as an instrument to show to the devotees that even such kind of ill intentions are always protected by the Supreme Lord. And uh, I was also actually wondering on this point, why did he get the idea of cutting into seven pieces? And what does this figure seven has and then further contain into seven to make it 49? Does it have some significance or it is uh, just an arbitrary thought manager? I just wanted to understand. Well, the Acharyas don't, the Acharyas don't comment on any special significance on this. But the number seven seems to become quite prominent. If you remember in the fifth canto, there were always seven mountains and seven rivers and it was seven, seven again and again, rivers, seven mountains, seven rivers. And it seems to be, I don't know quite the significance of this number seven, but certainly something seems to be there. I have yeah, to... The seven sages, the seven islands, the seven upper and seven lower planetary systems. Yeah, it yeah. seems to be come again. Yes? Hare Krishna, can I, can I speak on this? Please. My, I was hearing this old man's Dada Goswami Maharaj. So he was saying that the Braja which Indra is holding, it is designed in such a way that if he kills or if he hits someone, it is going to cut into seven pieces. Oh. So he uses his Braja twice. Once he tries to kill them, they don't die, and then again he kills them. So seven, 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 the forty-nine. Uh -huh. So every time he hits, he's going to break into seven. It's not that he personally decided seven, it's just the nature of that braja. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Prabhu. 
Maybe some, somebody who's familiar with the science of numerology, they may know something about the significance of the seven. <laughs> I don't personally know. Maybe some astrologer or something. I, I'll try to find out. It would worth, be worth looking into. Because I remember in Fifth Canto also, it was seven mountains, seven rivers, several places. Thank you, Lanesh. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prabhuji. But Indra has a position, right? He's, in a, he's, in, he's given a duty, he's the king of heaven, and he has to work, he has to establish a certain law and order within the universe. He's got a duty to maintain the universal order. The demigods are entrusted servants of Lord Krishna. They're obedient to the orders of Lord Krishna. So, yeah, he has some faults, but he has also some, some good qualities. And just as Diti, she had some faults, but she also had some good qualities. Good quality, her good quality was that she was ready to take instruction from her husband. You know, when her husband told her, well, you have to do this, you have to do this vow for one year, and she took the instruction, he, and she followed everything what he, what he had told her to do. Faithfully, she took the, the, the instructions to heart. Follow. This was a very good quality, the importance of being able to receive instruction and to follow the instruction, even though the motivation was not pure, but the method of receiving the instruction was good, that she, she didn't act totally independently. That is the nature in the modern society today, that people are very independent. They don't want to hear from others. They don't want to take instruction from others. They, they won't ask how to do it. But Diti was very uh, thoughtful in this sense that she took instruction from her husband and she did, her, she did try to follow everything he told her. And we can see the result. She got very good. She became purified. Of course, her intention was not to get, to get purified, but it came about anyway. So that's the, the mercy of the Supreme Lord. And as we said in the beginning, she was, you know, she was seeing Indra's fault, she couldn't see her fault. She couldn't see what she'd done wrong, that she's doing something wrong. And we see also the, the illusion, the attraction of women, how Kashyapa had become bewildered by his wife, but he was able to correct himself, fortunately, using his intelligence and his expertise, he engaged his wife in the process of bhakti. And we see the power of bhakti, how it purifies everything. So that's the ultimate instruction, the, the real message on this chapter, how bhakti purifies everyone. The, the Maruts become demigods, Indra gave up his envy and in, gave up his violent nature to go and kill, and also Diti, she also gave up her envy and violence by the power of devotion. They all benefited. And so if we do also this bhakti yoga, everybody benefits. All right, any other questions, comments or questions here? Okay, so we'll meet again on Thursday and we'll finish the, it's a short chapter, it shouldn't take too long, we'll see how long it takes. Okay, so Thursday night we'll finish off this unit, finish off the sixth canto and you'll finish also Bhakti Vaibhav. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Go back to Vrinda ki.